Like Julie said, I'm a graduate student at the University of Arizona. I'm working on my master's thesis under the supervision of Dr. Charles Van Riper. And for the last few years or so, I've been mostly studying the spread of diarrhea across the Colorado Plateau and the upper Colorado River Basin. And as I was doing a lot of these surveys out there, I started noticing some patterns along big river, or uh, big river ways and kind of wanted to pursue that. And so big part of my thesis now is looking at some of these patterns. So today, being kind of a management um, meeting, I'll present what seems to be a conceptual model of the uh, life histories of these beetles, kind of the biology of them, that I've gathered from other professionals in the field and then from stuff I've seen. So I'll kind of tell a story at first, then uh, show you some data I originally collected that led me to that story, and then uh, get into kind of the research I'm doing now to examine if, that, if the story is very true or not. So we'll begin. Um, and as I kind of walking through the story, you can kind of see there's these three red squares, and you can imagine each one of those is kind of a, a river reach. So we're looking at like a linear riparian system. Each box you could expect to be like a 10-mile stretch of river or one-mile stretch of river, whatever you want it to be. Um, but Tanner's foliates in the spring, at least up here in the northern areas where drops its leaves during the winter. And not too long after that, beetles emerge from the soil. They overwinter as adults, so they come out as these mobile units, and they likely spread around a little bit, mate, and uh, lay eggs. And so this overwintering generation, that's what we call it, lays the eggs of the first summer generation, or the F1. And because all the trees are green right now, we expect that the beetles kind of emerge where they uh, came out of the soil and lay eggs are in the same zones. So wherever we lay eggs, then of course those eggs hatch, eat the larvae out. And for those of you that aren't too familiar with diorabas, the larvae are the ones that do the defoliating. They're the ones that lead to the biggest impact to the tree. So this is really who's important in the story, is where the larvae get established and how many larvae there are. So let's say we have a ton of larvae in this first zone, and those larvae all feed and develop, and eventually you have a big defoliation zone. And in this case, this defoliation is really high level, there's no greenery left. So you'd expect as these, as these uh, larvae pupate into air mobile adults, those adults would kind of get out of town. There's nothing left in this area, so they're going to they're gonna disperse into an area of new green campus. And so you see kind of a population shift or a migration forced by this high level of population. And so then these, these adults move into a new area to colonize a new green camera zone, lay eggs. This is now the second summer generation. These eggs hatch in the larva. The larva again start eating all the leaves as they develop. And soon you have a second foliation zone. You got Clark tape there, making sure that there's no beetles on those trees. Um, and so, of course, then those larvae pupate, and these adult beetles that then emerge have two options. They can either go back to this original foliation zone that probably started refoliating as the tree responds to the abandonment of it by any diarabda and has time to regrow some new leaves, or they keep going downstream or upstream, wherever it may be, to a new area of the campus, colonize something new. Now along the Colorado Plateau, at least in the northern part, kind of uh, oh, north of the Utah and um, Arizona border, but along the river, it's a little different. Either way, along the Colorado Plateau, you largely just have two summer generations. Sometimes there's potential for a, a third summer generation, but likely by the time you get to the second summer generation, um, Daylines get too short, beetles start going into diapause, and they drop down as adults into the soil to overwinter. And so then they spend this long winter, winter under the trees. The trees drop their leaves and then come the next spring. All the trees, whether they're defoliated or not, re sprout new green leaves in the spring, and a little later on, the adults emerge back out of the soil to do it all over again. So that's scenario one. 
let's say a big flood came through in the winter and took out half the population. We'll go to scenario two here. You have not that many beetles in an area. They lay a bunch of eggs. Those eggs then hatch into the larva of the first summer generation. And you get partial exfoliation. And this is a silly cartoon. You can tell it's a picture of defoliation with a bunch of transparent green polyons overlaid on it. But I think you get the idea of, you know, this is partially defoliated. And if those larvae then pupate into adults, and there's still a lot of greenery there, those adults probably aren't going to move too far. And so you get eggs laid in the same zone, larva hatch, and then only after a few generations would you get this full, complete foliation of an area, and then a possible movement into a new area, and colonization of area. And then hitting by a the end of the year. So what that could potentially mean is that, you know, the size of the population, how many larvae are set into an area, how, how dense they are, how aggregated they are, and if they're all developing at the same time, could really lead to whether or not you get these heavy, high-level defoliation zones occurring. And it could really affect the uh, rate of spread of these beetles. If they don't have to leave an area, they might not. If they're forced to, then you might see massive dispersal occurring between generations. So that, that's the story. You can take home from it what you want. This is the original data that kind of led me to that story. This is data collected along the Dolores River in 2008, so in August, so kind of towards the end of the year. Um, to walk you through this graph, you'll see a few more of these graphs today. On the bottom, you got river distance. In this case, it's kilometers. Uh, kilometers here up here is the confluence of the Dolores and the Colorado River, but an upstream kilometer about one of four. That's the confluence of the San Miguel River. On the y axis, and I know I could have two axes here, but on the y axis is uh, the number of guy wrapped up, whether it's the number of adults or larvae, and then the percent of defoliation. We'll kind of zoom out here, but really what you can see here is this big high level defoliation zone between kilometer zero and about kilometer 70. And you have 100% defoliation in that zone and largely no adults anymore. So probably a bunch of larvae had defoliated this area, pupated into adults, and jumped into this new zone where more green cameras is present. Being August, this is likely where the beetles would end the year. So this is where the major population exists at the end of the year. When we come back in May of uh, 2009, the following year, as beetles are just emerging from the soil, we find kind of some pattern. There's a bunch of beetles here on the right side of the graph. The left side has been largely abandoned. Now, if these beetles go through the same process where this is a big population, they lay a bunch of eggs and larvae come out and foliate then what would be green trees here at the start of the year would eventually get transformed to the right side being mostly foliated and possibly a forced migration to the left. And what we found in May of 2010, coming back to the start of the year, is the population had largely shifted to the left and the right had been abandoned now. So as Andy Norton was talking, this could be that boom bust cycle. If you're looking at one point in time, it looked like the beetles had a bad year and a good year, but in reality, the population just moved upstream. So taking this data and, and kind of thinking whether high-level defoliation, we're talking like 80 to 100 percent defoliation, where almost all greenery has been taken away, this might really drive colonization of new areas, or at least drive dispersal of population. So to kind of examine that, I set up uh, three field sites this summer, looking at three different populations of beetles in areas that are just being colonized. And this was the San Juan River from Navajo Dam down to Farmington, New Mexico. Um, a population in Marble Canyon from Page, Arizona, that kind of extended the Fleece Ferry downstream. And then another population coming from uh, Colorado City and Canab region that's been going overland up in the Fleece Canyon. So again, I'll, I'll walk you through the story this time, but now I'm going to put an example of what we found in Marble Canyon here on the graph and kind of show you some data that was collected. But uh, what we see here is May, the start of the year in Marble Canyon, this is the distribution of adults along the river. And in all these sites, we found a little bit of a uh, 
I guess you could call it a phenological difference, but the San Juan River being a little further north in elevation, or in latitude and higher in elevation, fields didn't emerge until late May, really in full. In Marble Canyon, they emerged late April, and in the Grand Canyon, which is low elevation and a little hotter, they probably came out more like mid April than here, too. There, that could be the case based on the foliation later in the year. But, anyways, here's the dogs spread out along the river in May. We find eggs are spread out largely the same area, and then the larvae at the same time are pretty much stacked on top of the eggs. And there's a high spatial correlation between the presence of eggs and larvae in all these sites. So, then if we go forward a month, and look at where the defoliation was one month after these eggs and larvae were established. You can see the boundaries of the defoliation really mask the boundaries of where these eggs and larvae were established. And in a lot of cases, this might allow some predictions to be made. If you know that the distribution of, of adults, eggs, larvae, and all those things, you can really predict where defoliation is going to occur, which isn't you know, that sophisticated, but, but if you know kind of some idea of the intensity or the density of these populations, you might really be able to predict where a high level defoliation zone is going to occur, where no defoliation is going to occur in those established fields, and it might help with a lot of management. So, jumping forward then to June, um, this is where the defoliation existed in June in the previous larva, this is where we found the adults. They really seem to be right in the same zone. They haven't moved. You know, earlier we were talking about the story. If you have this high level defoliation, you see a forced migration as the beetles go search for, for green cameras. And so you kind of ask the question, do beetles disperse and colonize in relation to resource abundance, in relation to the amount of greenery? So if we, if we try and plot um, adults versus defoliation, at, um, for kind of the earlier part of the season, you'd actually expect there to be, if anything, a negative trend, or at least one of these quadratic trends where you have peak levels of adult at medium levels of defoliation and then crashing towards the high levels of defoliation. What we found is only, you know, a few of these plots showed any significant results, and if anything, they showed a positive relationship. So if you find defoliation, you actually found more adult beetles in that area. And if Anything again, they just rely. It, it fell into this quadratic equation. There's just a lot of adult medium levels of defoliation, but kind of inconclusive there. But if we go back to the Marble Canyon example, this is where larvae are then established in, uh, in relation to defoliation in June. You can see they're still right in that defoliation zone. There's a little high level defoliation zone here, and there's no larva found in that spot, but it's pretty small. But then if we jump forward to what these larvae do one month later, where the defoliation is in July, you can see the extent of these larvae really led to this big defoliation zone right here, about between uh, River Mile Zero and about River Mile 15 or so. And if, with this being a high level defoliation zone, we'd expect them the larvae to be shifted out of that for the adults to move to Green Tamarisk Lake, the new area where there's fresh resources. And in July, where we found eggs and larvae, was right on the, the edge of that high level defoliation zone here in this new zone. So going back to that question of whether whether larvae are established in areas um, relative to the resources available, you kind of expect to see what's, what we found the adults. You'd expect a quadratic fit to be best where you find a lot of larvae at medium levels of defoliation. They're the ones causing the defoliation. But you wouldn't expect to find a lot of them established in these high level defoliation zones. Only a few would be left as they're eating the last bits of green and they can take them off. Um, a few of these graphs you know, are significant and show good results, but not all of them. But if we just graph the amount of larva based on defoliation, on just looking at high level defoliation, you find everything shows a pretty, pretty steep negative trend, and only one of them is really significant in this case. But it helps lead to the point that larva aren't really hanging out in these high level defoliation zones.
Going back to the marble candy example, we see then uh, these larvae in green and the eggs in blue established in July, led to this foliation pattern here in August. And you can see what was once a high level defoliation zone is now refoliated one month later. And if anything's high level now, it's kind of towards the center of this distribution. Looking at August, the dogs seem to spread out and kind of abandon that center area between Vermont and 10 and 20. And then larvae again were also established on the edges. So it goes back to that thought that larvae are established now in the refoliation zone where green is available or on these new kind of colonizing hunts where uh, resources are, are fresh and abundant. So later in the season, if we try and again graph um, adults versus foliation, you find that the quadratic fit seems to describe it best. Nothing, nothing statistically really standing out. Um, looking at larvae at the end of the year based on the foliation, if anything, you find again a negative trend. And finally, to wrap it up, when we go back in September and look, there's almost no adults out in Marble Canyon in, in uh, September. And you can see what was once that high level defoliation zone just previously in August is now mostly refoliated, and now you got this new defoliation on the edges here on the right and on the left. So at all our sites, um, being again loud and too we different, beetles actually went into dive pods later on the San Juan. They didn't really disappear until after late September, whereas in Marble Canyon and Grand Canyon they disappeared sometime between mid and late August. So take home points, and I'll let you all take home, you know, whatever you want based on your own discretion. But um, as you'd expect, you find a lot of adults at medium levels of defoliation and a lot of larvae in those cases too. But it seems to be a negative trend when you get towards these high level defoliation zones. Really the point with all this I want to make is A, it's a good chance that when you get to these high level defoliation zones, you're going to see abandonment. And if you're really trying to manage for tamarisk and, and eradicating it, then you're almost going to want to try and um, reintroduce beetles in some of these areas as soon as they start refolding. Because otherwise you might see what Andrew Norton was talking about where you might think you're having a bust here where no beetles are around, but they're just upstream. So maybe you just got to reflect them and bring them back. At the same time, what I'm trying to show here is there's some predictive capabilities with all this. If you know the distribution of adults or larvae in one generation, you can kind of have a good idea where defoliation is going to be the next generation. So if you're working with, let's say, uh, nesting birds and you're concerned about the impact of defoliation on the nests, if you have a good idea of when birds do nest and where a lot of those nests will be, you can go through and do a survey maybe at the start of the year and find out where these populations exist and kind of have a good plan or map of what's going to be affected first in the year. Because really, you have early season defoliation zones and late season defoliation zones, depending on what generation you're talking about. Um, so, I think I'll just wrap it up with that. Here's all the good people that have helped me, and there's a lot more. And I've probably taken a lot of the things I expressed today from a lot of the people I've worked with, so I really thank them. And any questions? Well, first I didn't didn't record mortality at all, so I can't really speak to it. Um, but if anything, I'd say sometimes early season defoliation events can be the most um, episodic. They're a little more cohesive, the larvae are all developing at the same time. So out of nowhere, you'll get this big booming defoliation event out of nowhere, and then later season defoliation is more like a trickling effect. You kind of see defoliation slowly rising up in the trend. And that, you know, doesn't speak to your question about mortality, but um, that's, that's what I got for you. <laughs> Sure. The, the biggest thing we've seen in terms of stress on the plants and defoliation is we've seen a lot of trees get 
collated for the first time at the end of the year. And then they actually green up and stay green way later in the season than any other trees that weren't collated. So I've actually got really good data in the Grand Canyon this year. Um, typically in a non diorapa system, I guess, you have leafhoppers coming in, and then you have natural false nests. And a lot of the tamarisk will turn yellow towards the, the start of uh, winter and the end of fall, and, and they start dropping their leaves. When you go through and look at all the areas that were previously defoli previously defoliated, all those areas are green still. And you can really do a defoliation map based on what's yellow and green at the end of the year. And the healthy looking ones are the ones that were actually hammered all summer. So if you can take away that, that late season refoliation, you might have a lot larger impact on these trees from defoliation. But you know, the tree's saving grace is the fact that they can green up at the end of the year and get a, a couple months of photosynthesis in for or after the beetles are just steered. Um, it, it looked as though the beetles had two new generations that came up, so um, I'm sort of surprised that there, it wasn't based on some sort of temperature range, so I would have thought that the Grand Canyon might have had a longer season for the beetles. Is there some sort of life history um, thing that's limiting the beetles? There's a lot of life history things limiting the beetles. There is a good chance there were three generations in the Grand Canyon and in Marble Canyon. Um, they emerge based on temperature cues at the start of the year, so if that temperature cue comes earlier, they'll emerge earlier, they'll give, on, give them a longer season. They go into diapause at the end of the year based on day length, so uh, Danny, hopefully we'll talk about this, this is just, you know, but, um, all these populations are sandwiched then in between when the temperatures bring them out of the soil and when the day lengths stick them in. And you're going to have a lot of variability based on your latitude and your, your climate at that specific site. Did you were saying you think that there was three generations? I believe there probably was. I haven't picked through the data enough to pull out exactly what was what, but thank you guys. Thank you, guys.